pray together this morning, Jesus. God, we, we look to you now. We do ask you to lead us, God, to lead our hearts, to lead our minds, God, to lead every bit of who we are to you. God, I know we walk in this room today in all kinds of different spots, far from you, the best week of our lives, in the middle of miracles of, of you, God, wherever we're at, Lord, we ask that you would just unify our hearts in this time. God, you'd bring clarity, you'd bring focus to our lives. God, you would help us to hear from you th- through your word, God. We ask, God, that you would, you would bring encouragement, you'd bring conviction, God. Work in our hearts in this time. We love you, Jesus. We are committed to you, Jesus. We want to follow you. Jesus, we believe that you are God, we are not. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you grab a seat this morning? We're so glad that you're here in real life. If you don't know who we are, we exist to reach the world for Jesus, one person at a time. It's a commitment that we've had really since the last 14, 15 years that we've existed as a church, started in real life in Post Falls, expanded through multiple locations and church plants. This church here has been two years in the making, the last 24 months. God has been working powerfully here in Spokane. We are literally two weeks away from moving into a new facility and super excited about that. On your way out, you'll grab this card, grab multiple of them. They've got the details. We're moving to two services at the new location in two weeks. Uh, Really excited about it. Grab these, invite friends, family members. That first week is going to be a lot of fun. A big celebration is what we're going to do that week of God's faithfulness, his, his, um, his leadership in our lives. It's Thanksgiving weekend, and we can't think of a better weekend uh, to be together and to celebrate what God is doing. I want to have a special group of people stand, if you would. All of the veterans in the room, would you stand your feet so we can honor you and thank you today for your service? There you are. I love you guys. Thank you so much. I love that our nation is, is um, wrought with stories like yours of commitment, of sacrifice, of generosity, uh, just a, a willingness to serve when others won't serve. Thank you for, for being those kind of people, those kind of leaders that uh, make us who we are. Well, if you got in here without a bulletin today, I want to make sure that you get one. We're going to look to God's Word right now, and inside there is um, some sermon notes inside that bulletin. If you'd put up your hand, we'll make sure you get a bulletin or a pen that you could take notes, follow along with us. Also is our connection card. We ask that everybody fill that out every single week that you're here. If you're regular with us every single week, would you fill out um, just one side? If you're new, fill out both sides of that, would you please? And we'll drop those in buckets when they go by a little bit later on in the service. I was talking with one of the teachers from our uh, Evergreen Elementary, this school that you're sitting in right here earlier. Um, you saw on your seat, hopefully, this thank you card. He said on his way out last service, this is going to make a big impact in this school. Many, many teachers and administration do not follow Jesus, do not know Jesus, do not care to have us here. But at the same time, they have opened their doors for us over the last 24 months, and we want to honor them. We are people who honor those that have um, served, that have sacrificed, just like you veterans. We, we want to thank the school and the school district. So if you would, even right now, just to begin to write down the impact that God has had on your life, in your life, over the last 24 months, or maybe just the last month that you've been coming, whatever, through real life here, through this facility, what God has been doing in you. I want them to see the eternal impact that they have had in this city because of them opening their doors to us. They have been so generous, so amazing. We want to thank them, and and we're going to give these cards to them this week. So you can fill those out now. Drop them in the buckets later on or in the box as you leave afterwards. We'll make sure we put some gift baskets and things like that together. Well, I want to look to God's word with you. Um, We have been in the book of Nehemiah through this series called Restore. Uh, If you've got your sermon notes, grab those. If you've got a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians. It's actually way in the New Testament. I'll get you to why we're there in in a minute. Um, We're going to go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in just a minute. I want to help you understand where we've been as a church the last several weeks. This fall has been a a time to focus our hearts on the mission that God has put in front of us. We've really looked back at the last 24 months in so much humility of what God has done, but we look forward to the next 24 months with a lot of uh, excitement, some anxiety, some, some, um, wow, God, you are going to have to do miracles in us and through us. If these really are the steps that you are leading us to, God, which we wholeheartedly 
as a team are unified towards, we believe God's leadership is leading us to these next steps. Uh, if you have not heard what those steps are, this, this um, really movement of prayer, of, of moving into the new facility, of starting another campus, another location, of the global and the missional impact here in our city as well as on, in Honduras, we want so much for God to open these doors, to be able to walk through them courageously as a, as a team, as a church. We believe it's going to take a massive amount of commitment sacrifice generosity from each of us, each family, a part of this in the next 24 months. And so this series, Restore, has been seeing the story of Nehemiah, who was this, this guy who was in the service of the king of Persia. If you don't know uh, history really at all, this would not make sense to you. But Israel was a nation, God's people, that he had established over hundreds of years, many generations, and, and through a time of disobedience and wandering from God, they were actually conquered by the Babylonians. And, and conquered in that day, uh, this, this literally meant deported. The walls of the city were destroyed. Your dignity your dis- uh, was completely taken. Disgrace was normal. They would shave your heads. They'd make you look like not even the same people. They'd take you into slavery. They'd do all of these things to basically help people understand we're, we're in charge and these people are not. Babylon took him over, and then Persia took over Babylon. And here's Nehemiah, a man in the service of the king of Persia, really the, the, the king of the world at that point in time. Uh, and, and he finds, God really gives him favor in this time. Nehemiah hears about the state of his city, much like we've heard about the state of our city, the brokenness, uh, um, the city without an identity, without a name, a city with really kind of full of darkness and full of hurt. Our city um, breaks our heart just like Nehemiah's heart was broken. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, when he hears of how bad it is in Jerusalem, his hometown, the walls in, 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 broken and rubble and, and, and people's lives and in disgrace, he, he gets to a place literally of broken heart and this repentance before God. This repentant heart is critical for the mission that God is leading us towards. Understanding that God has called us, yet many of us have been complacent not doing our part. Nehemiah sees what's going on and recognizes that he has the ability to do something about the need in Jerusalem and literally spends days on end fasting and praying in in repentance before God, getting his heart back in line with God's heart. And then this story, not only is it a story of repentance, but it's also a story of courage. He goes to the king of Persia and says, here's what I need. He's trusting God. God, you've got to open the door. You've got to do things that only you can do. You've got to move these mountains. You've got to speak to the heart of this king. If Nehemiah did it wrong, he, was, he could have been killed. But God gives him favor. God opens doors and, and gives him opportunity with supplies to go back to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild the walls. And when he gets there, he inspects the walls. He sees the, 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 how bad it really is. Many of us, we've been inspecting our lives and recognizing our involvement and maybe in leadership uh, really has not existed in helping to make disciples, helping to move Jesus' church forward. I, I haven't been doing my part. As he's inspecting the walls, he, he brings the leadership together. And he says, okay, the way that this city is in disgrace and disrepair is not okay. We have got to do something about the needs in our city. We have got to make a difference. We have got to rebuild these walls. We have got to make this a city where God's name is great. We carry this same kind of mission, this burden in ourselves as Real Life Spokane to say, God has put us here in this time, uh, this place. We believe God is leading us and calling us to rise up to the occasion and begin the good work of rebuilding the walls or restoring God's glory to this city. We want so much for this to be a city where God's name is great. We know that the story of Nehemiah hinged on the unity of the hearts of the people. They said, yes, in one accord, in one voice, they said, yes, let's begin this good work. Let's do this thing. Every one of our hearts getting unified around this mission and saying, God has called us. We will do what he is calling us to do. We've identified two significant steps for us as a church. Really, we need to grow in leadership. That's disciple makers, people investing in other people. And we've got to grow in financial uh, giving to be able to continue and, and really grow in this um, grace of, of being a part of the mission. That's why those commitment cards are on your, on your chair. We've been talking about this for the last four weeks, saying, hey, every one of us is going to make a commitment to give financially over the next 24 months. And I recognize today that We see the story of Nehemiah, and we see the courage, we see the generosity, we see the sacrifice, and we go, okay, 
That's awesome, but I have no idea how to do that. Many of us are new to following Jesus. Many of us are new to the church. Many of us have been away from the church for a lot of years. In fact, you're maybe just visiting today, and you go, oh, great. My, my, my judgments of the church are confirmed. All they talk about is money, right? My, my judgments are confirmed. This is all we talk about. I want you to hear this today, that, that we will talk about money today. Do we always talk about money? No. At the same time, I, I don't shy away. You, you will find this about us. We do not shy away from difficult conversations. Conversations that make us uncomfortable do not give us a right to sidestep them and pretend like they're not in the Bible. To pretend like Jesus' heart doesn't care about where we give our money. For us to say things like, well, Jesus didn't teach, or Jesus didn't care. Jesus talked about, Jesus talked about prayer. Yeah, actually, he talked about money seven times more than he talked about prayer. Second thing Jesus, well, the first thing Jesus talked about the very most was the kingdom of heaven. The thing he talked about second most was our finances, giving. And so for us to walk past this issue and go, okay, it's uncomfortable, I don't want to talk about it, it really doesn't uh, make us the church that we believe Jesus is calling us to be. For us to be true to God's word, we believe we have got to tackle tough subjects just like this one. And so I recognize that, but I also recognize many of us have never started giving. Many of us have never known what does it look like to be a part of a team that financially contributes. For us to be prepared to make a commitment next Sunday, I believe we've got to spend some time really equipping us as a church today. That's why we're going to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Would you look at your Bible with me there? If you've got a Bible app, turn that on. Go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You can see it's in the New Testament way towards the end. You can look in your table of contents. If you, if you need a Bible, we've got extras in the back. Uh, we want to make sure everybody has a chance to, to walk with us through this. Chapter 8, Paul starts it like this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. So he's writing to the people of Corinth, people in this part of the world called Corinth, this, this port town, very rich town, very uh, well-to-do town that's got a lot going for him. And he's telling them about a a people in a place called Macedonia. He says, for in a severe test of affliction, things are hard, economy is down, painful times, right? In a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor, listen to this, for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. In Jerusalem, the church was in a desperate spot. There was persecution, there was sickness, there was famine. There was all this hard time going on, and the churches in all these other parts of the world were gathering relief funds, literally like we just were, if you're watching football yesterday, you still can text in Tim Box to Red Cross saying, hey, I want to help those that have been affected by this superstorm on the East Coast. We, these people in this time were given to help make uh, a, a need uh, happen, to help move the mission forward in different parts of the world. And Paul is saying, hey, in this kind of severe test of affliction, these people begged us for the opportunity to be a part of the mission. They begged us to be a part of what God was doing all throughout the world. They begged us for this favor, this grace, this opportunity. And really, for us today, this is what it, where it starts in our hearts, is understanding that us talking about our finances, an invitation to really from God to give God control of all of our lives and to be involved with him in the mission. For those of us to resist this conversation in our heart, close this part of our hearts off, we literally are refusing an opportunity to be a part of a miracle. And here's what I mean. Uh, Paul is writing to these guys, helping them understand what God is doing in Macedonia, much like Jesus did in John chapter 6. Here's, here, here's how this connects. John chapter 6, Jesus sees these 5,000 people in need. They're hungry. 5,000 men, really, plus women and children, a lot of people, they're hungry. Jesus, it says in John 6, that he had compassion. He wanted to do something about the need. So he looks to his disciples and he's like, hey, um, where are we going to get some food for these people to eat? Well, and and some of the the real practical people in the the group, like, like Philip, are like, are you kidding me? We have five th- I mean, do you see that our money? We, have, we make nothing. We're like fishermen, and, and we don't do hardly any. There's no way, Jesus. Well, Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother, actually speaks up and goes, well, actually, here's a boy here, and he's got some, some loaves and some fish, but uh, he's again in this place of fear and of doubt. goes, ah, but I don't know, five loaves and two fish, that can't really do much at all. 
He kind of in this place of fear and anxiety of doubt. Many of us that have never given before, this is the resistance in our hearts. We have fear, we have anxiety, we have doubt. There is no way that I can be a part of the miracle. Here's Jesus inviting his disciples to be a part of a miracle. And he said, all right, have the people sit down. John chapter 6. Have the people sit down. Takes the bread and, and, and the loaves and the, and, and the fish. I'm trying to say it all right. And he, he prays and, 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 and he begins to break them up. Literally, it feeds all of these people that are sitting in groups all throughout this grass, and, and they have leftovers that come back in. These, these disciples, you know, probably the people sitting in the crowd didn't understand necessarily, well, there's a lot of food, we're hungry, we're, we're filled, this is great. Many people that we help, that, that we reach out to as a church, many people don't understand what it takes, right, the miracles that God has done, the, the hearts that have sacrificed, the lives that have laid it on the line, the people that have said, I want to be a part of the miracle. The last 24 months has been completely funded by people who are willing to lay it on the line like that, to invite God to do a miracle in them and through them. And, and, and here in this passage in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul is saying, hey, look at these Macedonians. They begged us to be a part of this miracle. Jesus laid this opportunity in front of these disciples and said, hey, how are we going to do this? Let me show you what, we, what God can do with your little bit. Let me, see, let me show you the miracle that God can do through you as you surrender to him just this little bit. And many of us have this conception or maybe misconception in our minds of what it takes to start giving. But here's what I know. We have got to start where we are. Paul helps us with this in 2 Corinthians 8, 12. The willingness is there. The gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Look at uh, chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Not like, oh, I got, oh, the church, they just want, don't, don't give it, right? Or in the compulsion of like, well, everybody else is giving, so I better, you know, none of that. God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need. That right there, that fear, will I have enough? Will, the, will, the, will I be able to pay the bill? Will I be able to? We, it keeps us from getting started. It keeps us from just starting where we are. Not starting with these, these places of question and fear, but, but actually going, God, this is all I have. This is where it's at. Lord, I'm going to trust you with this little amount. What I love is just the ability to start where we are. When we do, when we start where we are, we really invite God into every area of our lives. There are places in our hearts right now that we resist God. God, you can take me on Sundays. You can have my church life. God, you can have this religious motion that I go through. God, you can, you know, um, maybe God help me in my work or God bless me in this. And and this is kind of our prayer life for many of us. We've invited God into like 2% of our lives. The rest of it we got, God, I got it. I'm good. Especially my finances, God. And we, we, we kind of act like God's got to pry this money out of our cold, dead hands if he's going to have anything to do with our finances. Just in our language, we are in a spot where we are resisting God's work in this massive area of our lives. This is why Jesus talks about it so much. Because he knows if he has our hearts, finances, that's, that's easy stuff. If, if we are opening our, our hearts to God, finances, that just, that follows. And so for him to constantly poke at it and go, hey, 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 are you willing to sacrifice everything? Hey, are you willing to sell all you have and go give to those in, who are poor? Hey, are you willing to lay it all down? Hey, are you willing to die to yourself? Are you willing to give me your heart? Jesus is constantly poking at this. Our finances are so attached to our heart, thinking it's our money. Paul challenges us to start where we are, to not let this fear and this anxiety rule us, to not allow this imaginary thing of it seems impossible to rule us. One of the families in our church, stacked against um, amazing odds, was willing to really ask God to help them through this process. And seeing what God is doing in them right now is miraculous. And I want, I want to show you a video real quick. Isaac, you got that back there? I want to show you a video of, of Kevin and Noel's story. Watch this. I'm Kevin, this is my wife, Noelle, and we've been married a little over a year and a half, and we um, both come from broken marriages, and um, just 
life circumstances that ended up being kind of messy and with a lot of debt and um, we kind of individually wanted to refocus our lives and reorganize as you know we wanted to put God at the center of our lives and we kind of did that before we had met and as we had met we wanted God to be the center of our marriage and starting with um, getting our finances in order and, and giving was a big part of that and I've known from like the past whenever I've done that God um, always was there to help out and this time this time around we wanted to be committed to um, giving faithfully consistently throughout the year and as we did that um, you know as we were restructuring and as we did that he continued to bless us showing us how you know we were able to do things and one of the biggest things was when we decided we want to start a family and have a child it was really important to us that um, I'd be able to stay home with our child and at the time just due to different financial circumstances, it wasn't an option. Um, but we decided we were still going to give faithfully and try to pay off debt and get to that point at some time in the future. Shortly after we got pregnant, um, still giving faithfully, God just continued to bless us over and over and over um, with just different things happening in our lives through um, changes in pay periods and raises and within a month's time we realized we would be able to be a one income family and I'd be able to stay home with our child so just there are so many reasons we could have put off giving to pay stuff off earlier and make that happen for ourselves um, instead we decided to give and put it in God's hands and we're faithful and he just blessed us immensely You see the invitation in Kevin Noel's story for God to figure out the math, for God to figure out the, the way it's going to go down and not try to control it up front and then, and then uh, kind of give based off of what I know or what I understand. There's a massive step of faith that we see in their story. The miracle of God really within a month to be able to reorganize their finances for, for Noel to be able to stay home is miraculous. Knowing the stuff that was stacked against them, the way that that, that life had kind of come out, down around them was just mind-blowing to see that work of grace in their life. And I know for many of us that have never given before, the courage to start is really the biggest piece. For those of us that have started giving and kind of given here and there, learning consistency, the second thing here, is really critical for our relationship with Jesus and really our growth in this process, this grace of giving. Paul says later in 1 Corinthians, he says in verse 16, uh, or chapter 16, verse 2, he says, On the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and try to collect it all at once. See, it's real practical that if, if we would start to give God consistently from our first, that he would figure out the rest of it at the, the back end. Yeah, we've got to be responsible. Yeah, we've got to you know, spend less. Yeah, we've got to make adjustments in our lives and reorganize how we spend stuff. But at the same time, for us to stop in fear and go, God, it's not going to work. It doesn't pencil out. It doesn't make sense. It's really a, a step of fear, not a step of faith. And I believe that God, not only does he call us to start where we are, but he also calls us to learn consistency in our lives. Like they said, they could have made excuses, could have put it off, could have said, no, nah, God, I'll, I'll, we, we, it doesn't make sense right now. We'll pick back up later when it does make more sense. What I love is that God has this ability, like he did with the fish and the loaves, to bring this massive amount of fuzzy math. It doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. But at the same time, we learn consistency in our lives. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul says, Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Those of us that give occasionally, we still wrestle with this, kind of going back to what, what we all struggle with, this very self-centered life. The American dream, the, 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 reti the retirement, the financial picture, trying to have it all put together, all figured out, so my family is fine. So my family is secure. Now, security is not a bad thing, but it is when it's our God. 
If security is ruler of your life, God is not. This is why Jesus said you can't have two masters, right? You can't serve one and love the other. That's not how it works. You got one master. You pick which one you serve. For many of us, we have kind of sacrificed our lives on this idol, this altar of, of, of security, financial um, wherewithal and well-being. And I'm not saying we're irresponsible. I'm not saying we, we pretend like tomorrow's not coming. I'm not saying that at all. But for us to serve that God of security wrecks the consistency in our lives and keeps us self-centered. Learning consistency in our giving actually um, develops a discipline. Like Paul says here, finish the work you started. Many of us are very good starters and do not finish anything. Many of us start really strong, really passionately, really with a lot of excitement, but don't ever finish. That's why we're, we're doing this, this 24-month commitment, is to develop consistency in all of our hearts. Some of us that have kind of given here and there, we've kind of tipped God a little bit extra, a little bit over there. Or, hey, I got an extra bonus. I got an extra this. I got a little extra that. We, we kind of give God the, the leftovers, many of us. Consistent giving, percentage consistent giving in keeping with our income actually develops a discipline in our lives. And not only that, it, it, it offers, we offer God our best. This is a theme throughout scripture. Not giving God our leftovers. It's a sacrifice that is not pleasing to him, he said throughout scripture. Anytime you give me your leftovers, second rate, kind of what's, what's left at the end of it, he's like, I don't want that. Should we start where we are? We start giving, but we've got to learn this consistency where we begin to offer God our first. Take it right off the top, right at the beginning. This percentage, every single week, every single pay period, every single month comes right out. We set it aside, like Paul says in this passage, we set it aside and we give it, not out of compulsion, but out of this decision that God has led us towards. That's why we've had this in your seat for the last several weeks, so that you can be praying so that God can be speaking to your family. God, where do we start? How do we start giving? What does consistent giving look like for us over the next 24 months? Is it about the mission moving forward? Yes, it is, but it's also about your heart growing in a relationship with Jesus. If your heart is resistant to God in your finances, there's probably other places as well. This is an opportunity for kind of the, the uh, kind of spiritual crowbar in many of our hearts to kind of get some things pried loose. Many of us, we need that. We've been in a rut for many years, and we're blaming everyone else for the rut that we're in. This is a moment for us to start to look and assess internally, where am I at with my relationship with Jesus? Have I allowed him to have kind of first place in my heart? Finances are an indication of that. Lastly, we want to grow in generosity. 2 Corinthians 8, Paul says, I can testify, I'm talking about the Macedonians, that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. I know for me, to give consistently has been a part of my routine and my family's habit for, for the last uh, 10, uh, 11 years, easy. But that routine is kind of, um, it, it's, it's one that, I don't, I don't know if you've, you've struggled like this like I have, but it's easy to just kind of get self-righteous in that routine of giving consistently. It's easy to just get kind of um, uh, complacent even in that routine. You know that about a routine, right? It's good, but at the same time, you kind of get lulled to sleep in it sometimes. For us and our family, many times, um, this percentage that we'd kinda, we had decided in our heart, I grew up with a 10% rule. That was like what God required. That is, you know, from Scripture, that is what God wants. It's a, you've heard the word tenth or a tithe of our, of our income, of our resources, that's it. And, and so for me and my family, we kind of set that as the, the ceiling in our family. Like 10%, we're doing what God requires. But here's what that's like. That's like me growing up. And um, my mom and my dad, they were really good at motivating and inspiring me to clean my room. And um, maybe inspiration wasn't the right word exactly, but, but we were talking about it a lot for some reason. And um, for me, in my, my world, cleaning my room meant the least amount possible to make sure mom and dad walked by the room and were kind of satisfied with it, right? Looked in and things were good. So if my, my dresser was constantly piled high with stuff, and, and so top drawer, I could open it and really nicely just shove everything right in, right? And it was kind of one of these moves that I'm keeping, and the same with the closet, right? Just or under the bed or on the backside of the bed. They never looked back there, Right? 
And it's kind of this least amount required possible. How much can I, can I, can I, can I get by with? And how much is God going to really notice? And hey, I'm, I'm good. We're good. 10%, right? This was the ceiling in my mind and my family's life. As we started praying and talking about this over the last six months, preparing for this series right here as a staff, as a team, a leadership team here at Real Life, my wife and I began evaluating and noticing that this routine, we, we, we're stuck. Going, we're not necessarily growing in generosity. Paul says, look at 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Since you excel in so many ways, that means you're growing in all these ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I want you to grow in this act of giving. I want you to move forward, excel, try hard to keep going, don't stop. So for this magical percentage to become this ceiling in our lives, we recognize was really us kind of saying, God, we're good, right? We're all good. You, you're good with me. I'm good with you. Let's, let's move on. Let's move past this whole finance conversation, recognizing that we weren't necessarily growing or excelling in generosity. This was a massive heart check. And as we began to reorganize our finances to be able to grow by a percentage or two percentages, as we started kind of going, hey, what is that going to look like for our family? This whole conversation kind of blew up in our face going, wow, we haven't talked about this in a long time. Complacency just sneaks in. It's not like something we're intentionally doing. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. You want a small crop? Plant a few seeds. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Look at verse 10. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. It's God's stuff, right? It's God's finances. God provides the seeds. God provides the bread. Don't get arrogant thinking it's all about you and your money and your stuff, right? God's the one that provides it. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest. Listen to this. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources. Not so you can live the American dream. Not so you can have life all squared away. Not so that you can boast about your riches. Not so that you can act like everything's all perfect and great. So that then he'll produce a great harvest of generosity in you. You understand his heart in this. It's not so that we can hoard it all for us and look at me and look at what my family has accomplished and look at how I've been able to pay for this and drive this and live here and do that and go vacation over there. No, so that it'll produce a harvest of generosity in our hearts that we are able to give even more away, not so that we can keep more. For us, that, that, that gets sucked into this kind of American mindset that bigger is better, more is best, is wrong. This, this, this harvest in our lives is so that we can be even more generous with our finances. These increases in our income, these bonuses that we get, we look at these moments and opportunity, these assets or these, these resources that we put away, we look at these as moments of God saying, hey, I believe some of you today, you've, you've already written, we've had over half a million dollars of commitments already come in. It's amazing to see the responsiveness of people. Over half a million dollars, I think almost $600,000 have already said, hey, next 24 months, we're committed. Our goal is two and a half million. So we still got another $2 million of commitments to, to really uh, encourage and inspire everyone too. But at the same time, I know some of you have already committed and, and hearing this idea of growing in our generosity challenges you. I'm going to challenge even some of you that have already committed to say, hey, we're doing the least amount required. We're doing our 10%. We're doing kind of what God has called us to. We're good, God, right? You can And understand this, this is between you and God. Nobody knows your income, nobody knows what what you've established, nobody knows the conversations, nobody's watchdogging this. This commitment is between you and God. And this is an invitation for you to invite God into every area of your life. And far be it from me or anybody in this leadership to keep you from that opportunity to be a part of the miracle that God is doing. And for you to make any of us an enemy in this and go, well, they just want our money. Who's they? It's not us. God has called us to this mission. We believe God is leading the charge. We believe God has given us these next steps. We believe God is calling us to this new facility, to this new campus, to these missions things in Honduras, to making an impact in our city. We believe God is leading us. This commitment is between you and God. We want so much for you to be a part of this team, be a part of this mission. And I recognize this. Many of you are sitting in the room scared to death today because you're brand new to real life. 
They're going, man, I, I just came here just to see what this thing is all about. I just, I, I don't even know Jesus. I don't, I've never been to church before. I recognize that that tension is here today, and so hear me on this. The only way that we are growing in this generosity, this act, this grace of giving, is because of the grace that we have, been, we have received. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, came to earth some 2,000 years ago to set us free from this sin, this life that we have kind of put ourselves in, this bondage, this slavery that we have enslaved ourselves with. Many of us surrounded by this financial stuff, trying to find peace, trying to find happiness, trying to find fulfillment to this longing in our souls. We believe Jesus is the only source of that kind of life that we seek, that peace, that hope that we seek. For us to seek anyone else or anything else we believe is wrong. In fact, those of us that have not received this gift of grace, this offer of Jesus Christ's replacement, literally standing in our place, stepping in to take the weight and the punishment of our sin, that he would stand in our place. This substitutionary work just blows our minds. This amazing grace of God in our hearts. We are so grateful to God that we can't help but respond by singing, by giving, by serving, by loving, by by not just kind of being controlled by our sinful desires, but saying, God, you lead this life. You are in control. I'm going to have the music guys come up here because we're going to stop talking. I'm going to stop talking today, and I want to give you some time to talk to God. We're going to spend some moments in praying and we're going to take communion here in a few minutes together, centering our hearts again on God's leadership in our lives. Inside your bulletin is a, is a prayer and a decision card. You have that commitment card on your seat. Maybe some of you need to grab your spouse's hand and begin to pray about what kind of commitment next weekend you're going to make. So cool, somebody donated over $2,000 worth of things that we're going to be able to give to every single person that makes a commitment next weekend. I believe it's going to be a visible reminder for those of us that have made this commitment to remember what God has led us towards over the next 24 months. We believe that his leadership is very intimate in our lives, and I believe God wants to speak to you right now, whether it's for the first time you're going to say yes to Jesus on that prayer card, that decision card. You're going to give him your heart. Maybe you're going to take the step of obedience and get baptized. Jesus says, get baptized, we get baptized. We don't wait. We don't just kind of make it a nice spiritual pick-me-up option. We say, Jesus told us to do it. We walk in obedience to Jesus' leadership in our lives. Just like giving. God, we give you control of our hearts. Is there places of resistance in your heart? Is there fear that dominates you starting to give just right where you're at? Nobody's dictating anything for you here dollar amounts, percentages, start where you are. Grow. I'm not making 10% this magical number. Start where you are and grow. Take your next step today. I want to spend a few minutes with you, you with God, praying, writing on that card right now.